May 22nd at 10 a.m. And today we are having our restaurant industry town hall in conjunction with Buncombe County, the city of Asheville and the Asheville Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today will be a series of town halls that we're doing in order to address the governor's safer at home phase two order. And uh, earlier we had personal care services. This of course is dealing directly with the restaurant industry. Uh, later today, the Asheville CVB Explorer Asheville will be conducting two on lodging as well as event and uh, entertainment venues. Uh, so I hope that you, uh, thanks for joining us today. So obviously a very tenuous time. We're all very concerned, maybe a little anxious about what our next steps are. Um, we have a very robust group here today and we're very excited to have all of you here. Hopefully get some of your questions answered, uh, but hopefully also you can provide your own input and guidance at the appropriate time to our city county officials we have here joining us today, uh, as well as myself to know about what's going on in your business going forward and what your needs and resources continue to be during this pandemic. We're gonna be joined today uh, by Fletch, Fletcher Tove, who many of you have probably seen at some point in the last few months. He is the Emergency Preparedness uh, Director for Buncombe County, as well as Jessica Silver, who's the Environmental Health Administrator uh, for the county. Uh, they'll be providing input on the order. Later on, you'll also hear from Dana Frankel, who is from the City of Asheville's Strategic Design and Development Office. Uh, so thanks to all of you for being here and helping us out here today. And with that, Fletch, I don't want to waste any time because I think we've got over 200 people here today to, to watch this town hall. I want to get straight into the order and then start answering people's questions as we go on. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Fletch. Uh, great. Thanks. Um, good morning. Good to be with everyone again. Uh, kind of working together through these phases. Um, I want to take a moment real quick on, on a personal note and say that um, I, I grew up in an independent restaurant in a Cashers, North Carolina. My parents had a acclaimed restaurant there for 13 years. So I'm very familiar with the, the trials and tribulations of the, the restaurant, you know, even during good years, good summers, the experiences and troubles they had with staff and getting month to month and having to shut down on off seasons and find other work and how difficult that was. So I understand like for what's going on right now is unprecedented for the restaurant industry. And that um, th this latest order doesn't necessarily make things better or easier for you, kind of put some pretty severe limitations on you that really kind of are going to handicap you guys just as much as being closed. So very aware of that, what the guidance coming from the state is. Um, but moving forward, I'd like to speak to, in general, what phase two means for the state and for Bocum County, um, and then what we're doing locally, and then get into the specifics for the restaurant industry. So. Today at 5 p.m. we'll be moving to phase two. Um, one big change from that is that we're no longer going to be under the stay-at-home order, um, but we have shifted to statewide a safer at home recommendation. So the idea is still um, if you don't have specific needs or <clears throat> um, reasons to be out recommended to stay home or out, out of public spaces as much as possible, but not, not an order, just a recommendation. Uh, second big change is our gathering limits. So for mass gathering guidance now, indoor space is 10 people and the outdoor space is 25 people. And that, that mass gathering guidance doesn't apply inside of businesses. We'll talk about that in a moment, but that, that's different. This is more for like social meetings outside, um, like getting together with friends or getting together to some outside events. Um, so you guys are going to be able to open at 50% capacity with some constraints and requirements. Salons and personal care are also opening similarly with 50% capacity and requirements as are pools. Bars and nightclubs remain closed. Um, museums, playgrounds, gyms and fitness studios and entertainment venues remain closed. Uh, one thing we're changing locally as well is we're removing the restriction on leisure travel bookings going forward. So, so um, local lodging can now book from anywhere. There are restrictions about, uh, for some of them, there will be some 50% capacity as well as having you know, one day turnover for rooms in between that. Still really pushing the three W's, wearing a cloth face covering in public, waiting six feet apart, washing hands. Also locally, we're pushing two more W's, wipe, wipe down high contact surfaces with increased frequency and wave. So avoid no handshaking hugs for a while. We're waving from a safe six feet distance. 
Additionally, um, yesterday the commissioners voted to make masks um, mandatory. I, th I think the way that's gonna play out is that's gonna be for unincorporated Buncombe County and the city of Asheville where masks will be mandatory. Um, it's gonna be not complying, will be not criminalized, but um, that's the policy that was voted on yesterday. It'll be reflected in the order that comes out today. <clears throat> we expect to have the order signed uh, today at 3 p.m. with our media update at 3 p.m. You can watch that on Facebook Live. Um, and we'll get into restaurant specific stuff in a moment, but we, we plan to align with the state's guidance for restaurants with one exception. I think the restaurant guidance that came from NC Department of Health and Human Services in the state allowed for some, some levels of self-service with constraints, but we're gonna say in Buncombe County, no self-service in phase two. So you can, you can have you know, buffet setups, but you have to have some mechanism, some system for servers to deliver that food. We don't want individual people going up to a buffet line or you know, any kind of self-service. So you need to develop whatever method or mechanism to avoid self-service. Um, uh, with that, um, we'll start taking questions here in a moment and talk in more detail, but I'll turn it over to uh, Dana Frankel from the city of Asheville. And if, real quickly, if I can interject here, Dana, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but um, if you guys have, and I failed to mention this up front, if you care to ask a question, please don't use the Q&A feature, but use the chat feature. Again, all these town halls are being recorded and the chat feature will end up being the transcript for these town halls that we later put up. So please, any questions or comments you have, use the chat feature, not the Q&A. Uh, and thanks, Dana. Please, please go ahead. Sorry for cutting you off. All right, no problem. Uh, good morning. My name is Dana Frankel and I work for the City of Asheville in the Strategic Design and Development Office. The City of Asheville is committed to supporting and responding to the changing needs of the community through phases of recovery. We formed an interdepartmental team to advance opportunities for businesses and customers to use public areas as well as private lots with more flexibility to more easily operate in alignment with public health guidance. I'm glad to announce today as a first step, the city is rolling out a new curbside pickup zone program to help support and prioritize safe and easy access to goods and services being offered for curbside pickup. Installation of the zones will begin next week downtown and on Haywood Road in West Asheville. An initial 31 zones were selected in locations with on-street parking in areas close to restaurants or generally central to goods and services. Each shared zone accommodates one to three vehicles and will be signed as 10 minute curbside pickup only. I also want to make sure that you and your staff know that businesses and customers can provide real time feedback on this program so the city can make adjustments and improvements as needed. A press release will go out later today with more details and we'll be providing a map next week as the program rolls out. Also today, the city is sharing details on how businesses and organizations can adjust or expand their use of private spaces. For example, this could mean setting up safe outdoor dining in parking areas. More information will be in the press release this afternoon. And other initiatives we're working on include expanded or more flexible use of sidewalks and on-street parking spaces for dining and merchandise, as well as larger pedestrian priority zones or temporary shared spaces for commerce and recreation. On those fronts, we're working to ensure that these programs align with public health guidance as well as ABC permitting requirements. Some of that is still being ironed out on the state level. We also wanna make sure that those larger initiatives can be effective in supporting our local business community with recovery and that we're intentional with engagement and strategic in implementing equitable solutions. So how can you stay informed? The city has created a web page that will serve as a portal for ideas and feedback as we consider these initiatives. And that web page is on the slide. The web address is www.ashevillenc.gov slash public space response. And you'll also find our contact information on that page. You can email public space at publicinput.com. City staff and city council have been receiving really good input and ideas over the past couple of weeks. Staff is tracking and reviewing recommendations, along with current and emerging best practices from other cities to help inform these next steps. 
We really want to hear from you on these initial programs and we want to know what else would be most helpful. This work does rely on collaboration, communication, and flexibility across sectors of government, business, and community. So we look forward to working with you on this through phases of recovery. All right, thank you so much, Dana. I really appreciate that input and be sure to check out that website. And again, the city's uh, press release is coming out later today to give more details about all of that. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fletcher, I believe next we have more specific recommendations. You went over the general uh, ideas behind face. So thank you all for your questions. Keep coming. I promise we'll get to them. Uh, but let's first go over specific requirements uh, for the restaurant industry. Right. So um, let me talk a, bit, a little bit about how we're doing this locally. Um, so we're adopting, as we did with phase one, we're going to adopt the governor's executive order 141. We're gonna adopt in conjunction with that, his FAQ document that accompanies that. So those come together <clears throat> to get, work together as legal guidance. And then on top of that, we're writing our local declaration, which will cite those, but have some specific um, areas where we, we deviate slightly. For, for the restaurant industry, the only deviation we have currently written is just that um, no self-service. And real quickly, I see a question about things like self-serve tea and soda fountains. That, that, that's fine. I think we're talking more about food itself, not like a drink machine. Um, but so this guidance you're seeing right now is coming from the FAQ document, the frequently asked questions from the governor's order. So um, I'm gonna, just gonna walk through those real quick. And uh, just so everyone's aware, I do, I do wanna emphasize that although we're moving to phase two, the, th the threat of COVID-19 is still very real. It exists in our community. We've been fortunate we have relatively low numbers, but we have to take this seriously. So I'm really asking everybody to make strong, honest self-assessments to see if you can meet this criteria to reopen. If you can't, we can be a resource for materials or guidance or education to help you meet them but really need strong self-assessments to, to make sure we can do this correctly. Um, and we're gonna continue to watch our metrics. This is all data-driven as we go forward. <clears throat> I wanna emphasize with people that our phase reopening moves both, both directions. So as we move to phase two, if in several three to four, six weeks, we see not the numbers we wanna be seeing, it's possible that we may put in restrictions again. That, that's a, gonna be an ongoing caveat to all these steps as we move forward. Um, but so for social distancing and uh, minimizing exposure, so six feet separation between parties, so that means between tables basically, so you could have a table with up to 10 people, um, but for, for multiple households, but between those individual tables, there needs to be six feet of separation. We're working under 50% capacity, which is from the fire capacity or 12 people per thousand square feet. Um, you need to post the emergency maximum capacity um, on, on your storefronts. Um, so that's, you know, whether your 50% of fire capacity or whatever number you're using has to be visibly posted. Um, you need to have signage, and this is from the governor's order as well, you need to have signage um, with the best practices and guidance from public health. And we have those resources on bunkumready.org. So that's, you know, the three W's, wear, wait, wash. Um, we also have signage to reflect the new mandate in town and for unincorporated Buncombe County for face coverings, um, citing, citing the law and statute there. So you could post that um, as well as other guidance that's on, on that website. Um, for high traffic areas, such as a checkout counter, or you know, if people are asked to wait outside, do you have space? We need to have six foot intervals marked. Um, and those, those are not just lit, Linear six feet, it needs to be you know, a six foot radius the best, to the best of your ability. Um, we have to increase our environmental cleaning and disinfection on all surfaces. Um, and <clears throat> I know you guys in your industry are you know, always pushing hand hygiene, but with increased fervor, you need to be pushing that. Um, it's required to do daily symptom screening of your employees. Um, real quickly on that, Symptom screening is not just temperature. If you guys have capacity and resources to do temperature checks, you can. But what's most important is you have to do 
the screening of symptom questionnaire. There's resources for that. We have a really good one we developed locally at Buncombe County. We recommend you using <clears throat> one, it addresses the specific symptoms we're concerned about. Two, it's very carefully crafted, so you're not gonna violate any kind of HIPAA concerns, some privacy concerns. So it's a resource on our website as well, bunkermoney.org. We're asking, you have to do that daily for employees, and there's also a log so you can keep track of those. Um, you know, the signage we have available as well, you have to post that, and if employees are sick, you have to, or develop symptoms while at work, you need to isolate them, send them home, and you know, have them go through the quarantine or isolation process before they come back to work, and we have guidance on that as well. Um, you go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> so, um, again, this is kind of what we talked about. Um, I know a lot of you guys are looking, um, who are able to open are looking at, you know, by appointment, by reservation only. Um, that's, that's a good practice. So you control people coming, control people coming in and out. Um, the way the order for mandating masks is written, so it will be all public facing staff. Um, those people in areas not accessible to the public, like the back of house, um, aren't required to wear masks, but um, to the greatest extent should. Understanding that, you know, dishwashers or certain people might be very difficult to, you know, op operate a mask when you're in that like, human environment or something like that. So there, there's, the order is gonna be written in a way while it's mandated in town, for those spaces not accessible to the public, it's, it's just gonna be still strongly encouraged. Um, yeah, so as much as possible, um, offer contactless payment options, but we do wanna understand that contactless payment is somewhat of a privilege. Not everyone has <clears throat> ability for credit cards or fancy phones that have that tap capacity. So still asking people to have the option of paying by cash if, if if necessary. Um, I think uh, we go ahead to the, the next slide. Um, we expect our order to be signed today at three and as soon as our local order is signed and the state's, the state's um, orders will be as attachments and we're pushing some new campaign material. Our campaign is shifting from stay, stay safe, stay local to stay safe, stay smart. Um, but we'll be pushing that all today, out today really hard as soon as it's signed and finalized. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Corey and we can start working through uh, some Q&A. Uh, sure. Jessica, um, our environmental health director, would you like to address any points before we get into the direct Q&A? No, you covered everything perfectly, Fletch. As he, as he usually does, but thanks for being here, Jessica. We certainly appreciate it. I know you can provide input and especially in regard to restaurants, this is a different kind of industry compared to some of the other ones we've done. Um, and so you guys are definitely, uh, it's a unique situation you're in from the reopening standpoint. Fletch, the first question I see, and I knew this was gonna come up immediately because there have, there have we've already been getting tons of questions about this, but how is the restaurant versus a bar defined? And if there's a mix of sales, how does, how does a bar or a brew pub or a brewery even know whether they can open this weekend or not? Right. Uh, that's a great, great question. Um, so traditionally, I think in the past, there hasn't been a clear definition of bars in, in the state uh, legal terms. Uh, but what, if you go to the state order, section one, paragraph one, is the state attempting to create a new definition. I'm going to go ahead and read that directly. Um, <clears throat> so it says, Bars means establishments that are not eating establishments or restaurants as defined in North Carolina General Statute 18B1002 and 1006 that have a permit to sell alcoholic beverages for on-site consumption under North Carolina General Statute 18B1001 that are principally engaged in the business of selling alcoholic beverages for on-site consumption. So um, that's the definition we have from the state going forward. Um, so there's no discussion about a mix of sales threshold. Um, we um, are currently reviewing with our attorneys. Um, I, I think the bar definition is pretty, pretty locked in about how we have to go by the state guidance because we could always be more restrictive. We can't be less restrictive. 
we currently have a discussion about um, where a brewery tap room would fall in. I know there's pressure from across the state. I've personally talked to a couple local attorneys who focus on ABC um, alcoholic brewery law in the state. I know there's uh, pressure going to the governor to clarify that. Um, I don't know when we'll get that clarification, but we're having that discussion right now. I'm still waiting a final determination on how like a brewery tap room uh, could operate. Um, so we're aware of those questions and seeking for guidance. We're reviewing with attorneys trying to determine that. We, we should, we'll have an answer on that by three today when we um, sign the final order. So should people wait to make their decision, Fletch, until you guys have done that at three o'clock? Or, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a tough question because I don't think that they made the distinction and um, outside of the definition you just gave, I think a lot of uh, brew pubs, for instance, have operated under restaurant offices for all intents and purposes, even though they may be a brewery. Um, right. And that's really been a question here. So should they wait so for that I guidance think, to make that determination? Right. So I think some, some places um, are very can fairly clearly operate as a restaurant, um, depending on how they're set up. So some places are kind of mixed. We're looking at one of the angles we're looking at is some places, you know, have a food truck. Some is kind of permanently assigned. Some they're rotating. But if we can see that there's scheduled food trucks that we could apply the restaurant rules to them. So that, that's, that's the angle we're pushing right now that, um, you know, if, if a facility has, you know, on-site food that they could operate under restaurant guidance, but we're, that's under legal review. We're trying to discuss that, you know, this is, you know, this is all happening very fast. We got this Wednesday returning, trying to get advice from the state, looking at the attorneys locally, um, working through that issue. But as soon as we get an answer, we'll push it out to this group. And then, you know, we're going to have something by three, but we're going to continue whatever that decision is, as we get more guidance from the state, get more input that may be revised. So just whatever the answer is that may be revised. Just please understand that. Okay. Um, what about the th the square footage rule? Does that include the back of house for restaurants? Yeah, um, I, I don't have it with me right now, but it's there. It, yeah, so here it is. Let me let me read it directly to you. Um, limit the number of customers to the restaurant to fifty percent, or of stated fire capacity. For spaces without stated fire capacity, no more than twelve customers for 1,000 square feet, square footage. And this includes the parts of the location that are not accessible to customers or guests. So yes, you include the square footage from back of house when you're making that determination. Great, that's, that's awesome. We get a solid answer there. Yeah. Face masks, obviously this is a big uh, concern. We varied a little bit as a county yeah. from the state order. What are the guidelines as far as when someone's actually sitting in the restaurant eating? Obviously, you can't eat with a face mask on. Um, right. So, and what about, and then let's see, the question also goes on to say, um, a wall of glass windows that create open flow, uh, would that constitute back patio guidelines if the open air is through, I assume the glass walls are probably up against the, out, the outer walls, my guess. Based yeah. on that question. Well, let me um let me address those independently. I think I think sure. they can go a little bit different directions. So, uh, access to mass sanitizers, etc. Um, I think we've been posting some of these town halls. I think if somebody can put it in the chat, um, some local resources um through the chambers compiled a great list of places to get like face coverings and hand sanitizer. Um, we'll we'll post that again. Um, there's some good local resources we could help connect the dots there. Um, I do want to talk about masks again. Um, you know, in the common vernacular, uh, we're, we talk about masks, but specifically we're, we're asking for face coverings. That's how the order is written for face coverings. And again, right. that could be anything from a bandana, a folded t-shirt, you know, a scarf pulled up, a neck gaiter, or like a common medical PPE ear loop mask or N95. So it's, it could be any of that stuff. So, um, as people come in, you know, all that stuff's acceptable. The, the fundamental idea is it's a barrier over your nose and mouth that are physically knocking down respiration droplets and, and particles. Um, 
so obviously very hard to eat with a mask on. So I, I think the intent here is that, you know, as people come into a lobby space, a waiting room, um, even at the, when they're at the tables without food, um, encouraging them to wear masks, obviously as their food and drinks arrive, they're going to have to take that off to imbibe. So um, do the best you can with that. I, I know that this is all tricky, nuanced stuff. I uh, appreciate the difficulty and complexities in this, especially um, you know, not having a lot of time to think through it. Um, we're still getting some guidance, some clarity from the commissioners about what the intent they had for this um, order was and how, how they intend for law enforcement to respond. But right now, from what I understand, it's, 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 um, it's not going to be criminalized. And then that, that second question, um, we have a glass wall and a wall of glass windows that creates an open flow of air. Oh, so I think, I think they're talking about like um, a lot of restaurants in town have like almost like garage door openings you could open up or different that's ways I, to that's really make it. Yeah, that's what I think it, they mean. Yeah. yeah, to open it, make it up almost like an outdoor space. Um, that's, that's a really good question. I'll, I would, I would think, I'll have to, I have to look. I think that does not, if it's in, in four walls, even with big windows, I don't think it constitutes patio guidance. I think when I think back at other guidance I've seen for facilities, if it's, if it's four walls, whether or not, regardless of square footage of window space, it constitutes um, an indoor space, um, as long as there's a roof on top. Um, I'll, I'll look into that more closely, but I think that I, Right now, I'm going to say that doesn't constitute patio space with four walls and a roof, regardless of right. square footage of windows. But I'll follow up on that. I don't think you mentioned this, uh, Flash, but I know we've talked about in the past, but what are the specific metrics that are used to determine whether we go back a phase or whether we actually move into phase three on June 26th as planned currently? Yeah, so um, I can talk real briefly at a high level about the four key metrics, the state, and we're, we're, we're looking at locally. One yeah. is syndromic surveillance. So how many people we're seeing reports of hospitals or healthcare providers who have symptoms? Um, we're seeing a, that trend go down. So we're good there, both at the state and local level. Second metric we're looking at is how many lab conferred positive cases we're seeing. At the state and local level, unfortunately, we're seeing a big rise in that. Um, so that, that's, that's a red, red mark there. Um, when we look at percentage of positive cases against the ratio of how many new tests we're doing, because we're seeing a lot of new positive tests, but we're also doing a lot more testing than we had done. <clears throat> so that lets us temper that result a little bit by saying, you know, the percentage of new positives is in a constant ratio with the, the percentage of new tests. And we're slightly above that ratio currently, but with our numbers being less than, you know, just at 200 and our overall testing beats, you know, less than 5,000, that small percentage is really just a handful of people. So we feel pretty much plateaued flat there. And then the final trend is hospital capacity. So statewide hospital capacity is pre staying pretty consistent. We have about 550 high ICU beds in service. Locally, we're doing really well. We've never had, I think, more than eight um, positive COVID cases in the Mission Hospital system at any one time. So we're, you know, a fraction of our capacity. So that's good. So holistically, we have two good trends, one bad trend, and one neutral trend. So um, that's the, what we're looking at. As going forward, as we're reopening, we know without a doubt, we're going to see more people, more cases, it's just how it's going to work. And unfortunately, we're going to see more deaths. Um, but as we watch those trends, those are the trends we're going to be looking at. If we see um, bad trends and metrics, we'll make the consideration to put in some restrictions. What that looks like, we don't know yet. Because if we, if we could identify where those clusters are coming from, are they, coming, are, are they going to be coming from restaurants? And we could contact trace it back to restaurants. Is it going to be coming from you know, other facilities, barbershops? Is it going to be coming from you know, whatever industry? The idea is that hopefully we can focus on that specific sector and put mitigation tools in place there and not have to go to a you know global restrictions again but we just don't know we have to this is all adaptive response 
that's yeah. kind of long winded, but that, that's kind of what we're looking at from public health. Right. I'd like to address the question about uh, water um, being available <laughs> for customers to refill water stations and drink stations. Um, if the customers, can, if you are giving the customers a glass or a cup to fill and they can fill those containers without touching a surface, like if it's just a, a push soda machine and the soda comes out, um, then that's fine. But if it's something that a customer will actually have to physically handle a pitcher of water to refill it, then we would advise that you have staff refill water and tea <coughs> for in those instances. And when you, um, if you do allow, if you do have, have self-service for beverages, make sure that you are giving the customer their cup and their lid um, so that there are, so that uh, those um, single use items can be protected from contamination from other customers that are using the same space. Um, Jessica, you but, want to touch on uh, general water and flushing pipes and the concerns with, other concerns with that? Sure, so there's some guidance out about if your facility has been closed this entire time, one of the things that you want to spend some time on is flushing your pipes. And that could be anywhere from a five minute flush to a 30 minute flush. It just depends on how large your system is. But when you flush your system, that basically just means go in and turn on all the faucets. Um, you may first notice some discoloration of water or you may even notice an odor just know that that's from your water not circul um, circulating through your plumbing system um, for a month or two or however long you've been you've been closed. Um, remember to also turn on your hot water heater, um, turn on the hot water to allow that line to flush. Um, the minimum recommendation that I've seen is 10 minutes um, to allow the lines to flush, but make sure that the water is running clear. And if you notice an odor, that the odor is gone. And it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to experience some of that with the businesses that have been closed. So that's an important, um, an important piece to reopening. Thanks for that, Jessica. And Dana, thank you for answering those questions as well through the chat, um, especially with regard to parking as well as the Haywood Street uh, uh, issue. Um, Fletch, we do have another question about mask. Can people refuse service to customers who are not wearing a mask? And if, you know, what should be the protocol there? Because I'm sure that's probably the follow up. Yeah, absolutely. So um, regardless, so the, the commissioners just voted yesterday to make masks mandatory. I think that's going to only be for unincorporated Buncombe County and Asheville City. Um, but we, take a step back before that vote you guys have always had the right to enforce that um, through the same as the no shirt, no shoes policy. You guys can require that of people coming in and charge them with second degree trespassing if they refuse to comply. Now um, the county has implemented that as a mandate that we sign into effect today. I don't think that, I think the order goes into the, today effect at five, but we're delaying the requirement for masks, I think until sometime next week to allow people to prepare and get supplies. Um, but now, yeah, you can ask people to um, to leave or not come in without a mask. Um, like I said, we're waiting for some more guidance from commissioners about what, what intent is, but it's not, they're not planning to enforce or criminalize it. Um, but what, what I do, so what we've seen from other jurisdictions, nobody's been effectively able to enforce this. And unfortunately, what happens is sometimes people will push boundaries and become aggressive. And my recommendation to you be if any time as this goes forward, whether you're choosing to or just following the county guideline, guidelines on, on face coverings, the moment somebody becomes aggressive, just go ahead and call law enforcement. Don't try to handle it yourselves. Um, we're working with the Sheriff's Department and APD to talk through what those protocols look like, what the response looks like what the commissioners expect from the enforcement side. Um, so I, I don't have all the answers for that right now, um, but we're working through that. But um, definitely if you want to, if you look to enforce that um, public health in the county, we'll support that. 
Yeah. And Fletch, I'll chime in here, even though it's not, they're not criminalizing, not wearing a mask. If someone shows up to your place of business and your property and they're being disruptive, they're being aggressive, th there are other criminal yeah. charges they could face anyway. One is trespassing is always, if they violate those, the uh, code on that, uh, things like disorderly conduct, they can be arrested for. So um, it never hurts to call the, the, the non-emergency number for your local law enforcement. In addition, 211s has been a pretty good resource throughout all of this to, to talk to from United Way. So um, I would recommend those things, but um, you know, it's always an option. And, and we realize this has become a sort of a political issue and people are out there uh, resisting this, but um, it is the county's mandate. And, um, and you also have a right to refuse people's service in your place of business. So just always keep that in mind. Um, let's see, what are some good resources? This is a good general question for anyone really, but what are some resources and locations still available for COVID testing right now? For yeah. So, um, we, across the County, we've greatly increased testing capacity. Um, providers have greater access and more uh, leeway about how they prescribe those tests. Um, we have, um, yeah, we have urgent cares range mercy her providing tests we also have for specific communities now um the last couple of weeks we've been doing community testing again but that's primarily focused to be walk-up testing for those underserved communities and those will continue for the upcoming weeks and we'll make those announcements is there a mandated procedure still in place if a, an employee tests positive yeah absolutely uh if, if it, people are symptomatic, they, they should not be at work in the first place. Anybody symptomatic needs to be sent home, isolated, and go from there for review and testing and not report back to work until they meet that criteria, you know, of um, cl cl clear test in three days of no, no fever and other symptoms. What would a business owner or manager need to know about uh, contact tracing and what information they would need to make sure they have uh, if they find out some information like this, whether it's a customer or an employee. Um, that, and, that, yeah, that's yeah. a function of public health or communicable disease nurses. Um, yeah. That's always been a core function of public health and they'll, they'll do that review and reach out to people as they do that contact tracing. Okay, great. So did, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jessica. I saw a question where someone asked specifically about getting contact information for all their patrons. That would be really great if you think it's practical for your um, specific business, I would think that would aid the communicable disease nurses in doing that contact tracing um, and could uh, possibly get information out to um, the, the patrons of your restaurant quicker um, about a need to isolate. And Jessica, while I have you on the, on, on the line, we've gotten a couple of questions about uh, takeaway containers, uh, disposable plates, cups, and those things, things of that nature. Is that going to be required during this time of restaurants to utilize those? Or are they still allowed to use their same utensils and cups and plates like they always have? They're still allowed to use the same utensils, plates, cups, multi-use utensils the way that they have in the past. Um, and uh, just follow, follow the normal rinse, wash, sanitize procedures between each um, guest. I am looking for information on, um, I haven't seen any different information from the state regarding uh, restaurants to disinfect the multi-use utensils. Um, so I would say checking your um, sanitizer concentration is going to be paramount if you are using multi-use utensils. And here's a good question as well, Fletch. This might be a better question for the county commission and clarification on the mask mandate. But if it's mandatory for the establishment to uh, require that they wear them, are they obligated then to offer a supply a person with a mask who doesn't have one? Um, so they're not obligated to. Um, we're trying to come up, I know we've ordered 10,000 bandanas to pass out from the county, um, but that, I haven't heard anything about them being obligated to offer that. Um, so I know some people talking to some other town halls have planned to have um, either disposable masks they can offer and sell, um, you know, for a dollar or two or have, you know, like actual face coverings, like hand stitched ones that they have at the front that they could sell to people as they come in. 
um, but there's no obligation to provide that. Okay. What about someone comes in to pick up a to-go order? Are they required to wear a mask up to, or a face covering, excuse me, up to, to like coming in and coming out of the restaurant, whether it's at the bar or wherever? Yes, as, as, as I've seen, as the order's being written, the language we currently have, it's, it's once you're indoors, you need to have a face covering on. So if you're coming in just to go to the bar and pick up the to-go order, you'll be required to have a face covering. And going back to the employee testing positive, if an employee tests positive, is a restaurant required to go through certain steps for sanitation purposes? And are they required to close for a certain period of time? The um, guidance, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. The guidance that I've seen from the state is being rewritten right now. I see that it's undergoing revisions. I went to the website to get the latest. Um, but uh, in the, the past experience has been that the restaurants have closed down to properly disinfect. Um, that was a voluntary, voluntary closure. Okay. So it's not required though. At this time, because it's going under, under revision um, through the state, I would say I would wait to weigh in on that um, because I don't know what the state's new requirements will be. Okay. And I see that uh, Jane Anderson from uh, Asheville Independent Restaurants is here with us. And uh, Jane, thanks for being here. We always appreciate your advocacy and everything your group does. Um, are, are there parts that we're missing? I know the NCRLA has put out some guidelines. I don't know if they were incorporated in the local order or not, or in the state order. It looks like a lot of them were just from my cursory look at the DHS guidelines. Is there go to in regards to that, if there are any questions outside of this um appreciate any input that you can provide or, or if someone else knows about that and their efforts there because i know they've been at the forefront at the federal and state level and and locally uh, working on those things is a face covering required we have a question from scott here is a face cover re covering required for outdoor dining hey scott that's that's a great question i from what I understand of the commissioner's intent is that it's on the premise premises. So on like the patio, um, it would be required not obviously not when they're eating, but as they're, you know, spending time or um, congregating for periods of time. I'll, I'll try to get some clarification on that and make sure that's clear as the order is written. Okay. Um, Fletch, you might not be able to see this, but in the, someone type in the Q&A. And again, guys, please use the chat feature if you can, because it's going to help create the transcript for this conversation. But um, I do think this is an important question. Um, some people are trying to claim, and it's in quotation marks, that they can't wear a mask due to ADA or HIPAA, uh, need for their disability, um, is, and that they can sue the business owner to force them to access their space. Now, this could be misinformation, or it could be who knows what a person's individual situation is. Um, can folks still call, contact law enforcement in this situation or what would you recommend they do there? Yeah, so yeah. Um, we've, we've seen that. Um, I think th as this is written, a face covering um, can be pretty loosely interpreted. So it's not necessarily has to be like the sealed mask that's like sealed around the face and nose it can be like a loose cloth or other things so again the idea is a physical barrier that knock down particles and respiration droplets so i, I think uh, i have to get guidance from the commissioners on this about what what, the, what their intent was but i, th I think um I, you know when we look at the state order and i think what ours will reflect is that um, people who cannot wear a face covering due to medical or behavioral health conditions, people who are under 12 years of age um, are, are not required to wear face coverings. So I, th I think that's how our order is going to be written. Um, whether you can make the determination whether or not somebody actually has a uh, behavioral health condition or medical condition, you guys can't be making that, you know, no, no, unless you have, of a doctor on the side every day, but so I think if somebody somebody's saying that, you just have to go by it. But th there's also, um, you know, like I said, it's the definition of face covering is very loose. 
you, they can be, you know, ask them to just wrap something loosely around their, their face. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be like the form fitting mask. I think that's good. Uh, good advice. Let's say an employee disregards social distancing. They go to another state with different regulations um, and potentially put other employees and customers at risk. Is there any action that the employer can take for the safety of the other employees? And I think this probably goes back to the screening question, right? Fletch is my guess. Yeah, th I think the screening question will do some of that. And also you could just not, if you have concerns, you can not put them on shift or not give them the hours. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, try, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do some quick research on that other question. I, I want to reference something specifically for you guys as far as the, uh, the mass gathering guidance. So Fletch, I have it. Um, if you're talking yeah. about the question about part of dining yeah. and part of it is not, is the capacity still 25 only? So restaurants are excluded from that mass gathering right. limit but your overall uh, occupancy has to either be 50% of your to of your uh, fire code occupancy number or 12 people per 1,000 square feet. And that includes indoor and outdoor dining spaces. Right, so, and then, mm -hmm. yeah, so if you look at the governor's order 141, it's section seven, um, sub paragraph A, sub paragraph two, exceptions from prohibitions on mass gatherings. It says this mass gatherings does not apply to the restricted businesses and operations identified in section six, which is restaurants. So, right. so that 25 number and 10 number is inapplicable to the business of the restaurant. Right. That goes to whatever your capacity is individually. Uh, thank you, Dana, for sharing that. We had a question about, uh, a map of all the uh, city garages and available city parking. And you can find that at ashwincy.gov forward slash find parking. I've used it plenty of times. It works great. Um, food service. Uh, and this might be a Jessica question. If, is it better to have your employees wear gloves or not wear gloves for the server as well as for the food preparers? The only time gloves are required within food service is if, uh, you are hand. Um, you have someone handling a ready-to-eat food product. Um, so to say one is it's better to wear it or not to wear it. Um, I remember before that part of food code was in, um, having strong opinions about um, people not wearing gloves appropriately. So what I would say and highly recommend to to mm -hmm. everyone is if your food workers are or your staff are wearing gloves make sure that they know if they touch their face they pull out their cell phones they um, um, touch a doorknob then before they go back to handling food they need to remove those gloves wash their hands and then apply new gloves if that is your practice so take a, i would recommend that you take a very uh, a good look at your standard operating procedures as it relates to gloves there's no requirement outside of food uh, people that are preparing ready to eat foods uh, to wear gloves so that's up to you individually. I can say that you can always call environmental health if you want us to assess your processes just to make sure that you're being as safe as you possibly can. Um, but encouraging hand washing in between change of tasks or in between serving one table and serving the next table, for example. Yeah, and I, I want to jump on that real quick too. I saw somebody earlier posted about they're not going to allow their staff to have their cell phones on them. Um, that that's a probably really good best practice. And you know, a cell phones like a third really dirty hand. So um, make sure people when they sanitize stuff, they're sanitizing their phone as well. And considering like not allowing staff to have to be looking at their phone in and out when you're serving, because uh, it is just like a third dirty hand. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Beatty from NCRLA is on, on here. And, and John, thank you for sharing that guidance. But I think you just shared it to um, our panelists. If you don't mind sharing that same link with all the attendees, that would be fantastic. Thanks for doing that. Um, 
Philip asks, if you have a full bar, is it required that guests order food or are they allowed to purchase only a beverage? And I assume this means in a restaurant, I assume is what the Yeah, question. so um, i trying to think. I, th I think I saw something there about, you know, the bar still has to maintain the, uh, the, si the six feet of space. And Jessica, do you remember if there were restrictions on the bar itself? Um, just it has to maintain the six feet of separation, but it doesn't say that if a restaurant has a full bar that someone can only has to come in and order food when ordering a drink. So if you are permitted as a food service establishment and you happen to have a bar um, that's part of your normal operations. Um, I would say that people could come into the bar as long as they are um, socially distanced six feet and um, they're wearing a mask when they come in and they are within your 50% capacity or your 1,000, 12 people per 1,000 square feet, depending on which one is smaller. Um, if you're in within that quantity of folks, then you should be fine. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. Uh, Stephanie uh, Brown is also in here from Asheville City B Explore Asheville um, and wanted to make sure that we let everyone know that you can also uh, print the poster of Asheville Care Stay Safe Pledge, which is between the uh, owner and the, and the customer. And it, it's a poster that um, is uh, well done and, and you can definitely get that there at AshevilleCVB.com. So make sure that you uh, take the chance to do that. Does six feet uh, count six feet from the bartender as well? Yeah, so the, um, the order is written. So it says, you know, the, the servers and waiters don't have to maintain six feet because obviously they have delivery. I think that applies to the bartender, but definitely a best practice if you have like the, the focal point of the bar where the bartender is doing most of his work, I would work out that way, you know, so that the people aren't sitting directly across from the bartender if you have that capacity. Another question about two seats together at a bar six feet apart. If it's a couple and they're there together, that's fine. Because we, when we look at the tables, we see them as individual units. So if it, whatever the table is, you need to six feet between. And if two people are at a bar together as a group, that's if you can arrange that and have six feet in between. And again, that six feet is not linear feet. So you don't just look at the bar and say, okay, down the bar, we have six feet clear. It's also behind them. You know, is there a table six feet behind? So it's a radius, not just linear feet in a direction. <clears throat> right. Um, can I address the question about outdoor space, adding outdoor space? And does it, the question is, are we allowed to add the new outdoor space to their capacity, even though it wasn't included in the prior reopening? From what I understand in discussions with the fire marshals, you are not allowed to add to that capacity. Um, so whatever your um, occupancy level is now, take 50% of that, half that, and that's how much you can have, whether it's indoor old space or outdoor new space that was created. Yes, and, and this brings up an interesting uh, concept too with regard to ABC permitting. And I know that we've had conversations with uh, Jane and Air, with uh, the city development offices, um, and, and directly lobbied the governor uh, to talk to the ABC director, uh, as well as things like DOT uh, permitting to help allow for us as a local municipality to do more uh, expanding for ABC permitting, but also uh, street and sidewalk <laughs> closures perhaps to help with some of this expanded capacity issue that we're gonna have when you have all these awesome uh, restaurants that we have here, they might not be, you know, 50% capacity viable. So we really wanna do as much as we can in the way of regulation and, and policies and permitting in regard to that and make it streamlined, make it happen qu quicker than it normally would. Because two to four months is, is you know, it, it could be the difference between life and death for some of these businesses. And so we've advocated for that directly to the governor. Uh, those recommendations were taken in, in the hand by the recovery cabinet. And there is a section in this order that I've been mentioning that directs the APC essentially to uh, work closely with municipalities and, and be flexible as possible on those things. And, um, and hopefully we'll see some more guidance on that going forward as well. All right. 
Do you have a contact for finding out what the state of the occupancy limit is? Am I going out? Did I go out? I'm sorry. Yeah, that we heard you, Jessica. You want to? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that should be on your fire code certificate, your occupancy limit. Um, so if you don't have that, I would suggest that you contact the fire marshal's office. Um, and if you don't have that, it's even written in the order um, that if if someone doesn't have an occupancy limit, then you um, take a look at your um, square footage, overall square footage. <clears throat> Yeah, I would look at your actual layout if you don't have an actual, because one of the questions says, you know, occupancy limit applies only to indoor dining. Um, it, you should still, if you have an enclosed outdoor space or patio space, you should be able to find that, find that out. I would, I would ask Heather, if we could go to the next slide, please. I want to make sure everyone has plenty of time to take on these resources um, or actually going back to the, I'm sorry, uh, Heather, go back to the resource links page. There we go. So that, that can be really helpful to utilize a lot of these uh, resources we have here. Buck and Ready, of course, the, the state page is ncgov forward slash COVID-19. Uh, the city page on public space responses right there that we've talked about. And then countonme.org are, are great resources to use. Um, and then you can also find all of these, the posters that you're seeing. <laughs> so the three W's posters and others uh, are available on that buckhamready.org website. You can always also visit the AshevilleChamber.org forward slash coronavirus website as we try to compile as many of these resources together in one place as we can. So we're doing our best to keep track of everything as we know information is flying around us and, and going really quickly. Um, the last question we have here today, if we can go to the last slide, please, Heather, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> sorry for going all over the place. There should be a direct link on that website. Um, for the required signage, Liz, on the buckandready.org. Do you know where it is on that website, Fletch? Can you direct uh, everyone to the, where the actual signage is on there? Yeah, there's, um, I don't have it pulled up right now, but there's an article that says uh, industry resources and signage, I think. Um, we'll make sure we push out the direct link to this group. Okay. Uh, so I put a quick question about um, tables. So right. the, the six feet apart, and you can see this in the diagrams, in the order, in the FAQ, it's six feet between tables, not, not between people at a same table. Right. And so with that, we would encourage everyone to continue your thoughts and put your feedback in the chat, whether this was helpful for you or not. Continue to utilize those resources and all the websites that we mentioned. Um, this has been recorded. It will be made available on our website um, at astralchamber.org forward slash coronavirus. And so you'll be able to see that. In addition, where the, the county is putting together the transcripts and the frequently asked questions document to help address more of these questions. But if you get off the call, and you're like, oh man, this is a big question for my restaurant and I forgot to ask it, please utilize that email address you see there on the screen. It's pretty simple. It's business at buckhamcounty.org. And that's a really good tool for you to be able to get more questions out and have those answered through that. I really want to thank everyone for joining us today. Fletch, Jessica, Dana, uh, Tim Love, who was quiet over there, but was here keeping a watchful eye on us. Heather for utilizing the slides for us, um, as well as chamber staff for putting this together. Tim has a distinct cuteness advantage there in his picture, if everyone can see. Um, <laughs> we have an extra panelist on board. Happy to have him. Um, but thanks everyone for tuning in today. I'm very uh, excited to come to your restaurants. Uh, I have missed uh, being out and about in Asheville. Of course, we wanna do everything safely and keep public health at the forefront of everything we do and your employee safety. Uh, but I'm excited to see and, and take my family out uh, in, a, in a safe way to, to many of your locations and, and excited to get into this. Um, during this anxious time, we really hope that you and your businesses are again, are finding the resources you need. I've been Corey Atkins, the Vice President of Public Policy for the Asheville Chamber. Uh, thanks to the city, county, and all of our public health folks for helping us out, helping our businesses out, and uh, everyone stay safe out there, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.